my values and beliefs are those that we need to move forward to eradicate sexual violence and harassment across the province, across the country, everywhere. I know the court of public opinion moves fast. I've instructed my attorneys to ensure that these allegations are addressed where they should be in the court of law. In short, I reject these accusations in the strongest possible terms. It's not my values, it's not how I raised, it's not who I am. He was visibly shaken and, as it turns out, completely alone. That was from Patrick Brown's remarkable press conference late last night when the Ontario PC leader promised to stick it out and fight back. That resolve didn't last long. In fact, it lasted just hours. He stepped down a couple of hours later, leaving the progressive conservatives to clean up the chaos only months before a pivotal provincial election. Here to cut through that chaos at issue. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal tonight, Andrew Coyne in Toronto, and Althea Raj is here in Ottawa. I was at the airport earlier and a guy hollered at me, man, it's going to be a good ad issue tonight. So let's see if we can deliver on that. Um, what do you make of the way this unfolded, Andrew? <clears throat> uh, I could not have been worse uh, handled, I suppose you want to say, from a public relations standpoint. Uh, his entire senior staff had resigned when he refused to quit. So I presume it was his decision to go out and do that press conference, which was as disastrous as it could possibly have been. There's a school of thought that says that, oh, the people around him must have known this was coming. Mm -hmm. I think they knew something was out there. I don't think they could possibly have known it was this bad, or you pres presume they would have been, uh, either they would have left before or they would have been better prepared. Uh, what did you make of it, Chantel? I mean, I don't, I can't remember a press conference where someone has looked so stricken uh, and still tried to maintain his, his innocence, which he can do, certainly, but think that he could continue in the job, even with the allegations there. Uh, especially when he himself raises the issue of the court uh, of public opinion. Sure. I think his first <laughs> focus group was his own staff. These people were loyal to him. They wanted him to become Premier of Ontario. They would not stick it out. Uh, and, and that kind of said it all, that there would be no reprieve. I'm not sure you can prepare for something like this if you're a staffer working for a candidate that prominent uh, in an upcoming election. I mean, what scenario, what alternative scenario could you have except to say you've got to go? Uh, and I think the outcome uh, the saving grace was that it happened overnight and didn't mm -hmm. drag on over two or three days. I don't actually think these staffers were loyal to Patrick Brown. Um, Andrew, uh, sorry, Ali Khan Velshi, Andrew Boddington, Dan Robertson, they were loyal to the cause. And when it became clear that Patrick Brown was not going to be the vehicle by which they could win the Ontario provincial election, they were very quick to get rid of him. And they will... Re they will remain there to hopefully, in their minds, I think, uh, be there for another new leader to pick up where Patrick has left off in terms of running on the platform that uh, they spent so much time developing and uh, trying to bring the PC party somewhere towards the middle and make them a perhaps more uh, that electorally does, favorable to uh, Ontarians. Go ahead. That doesn't talk. change the fact that they were the first focus group that Patrick Brown Absolutely. met. And they were people sure. he knew well, and he couldn't sell it to them. Yeah, and you would expect that these people who've been around him, frankly, for about 10 years, would have known some of these skeletons in the closet. Uh, if there was anything huge in their minds, they would have sort of prepared a plan, and clearly there was no plan. Okay, uh, Andrew, where do you think this leaves the party? Um, again, there's a school of thought that says there's a silver lining in this, that uh, you know, it would be better that this happens now than that it happened in May or June, and that's true. The other thing you hear people say is, well, he was a pretty terrible leader anyway, and maybe they'll be able to get somebody better, which may be true, but I don't think you can just overlook that the leader is not just the leader. The leader is a whole set of compromises and bargains that have been made between different factions of the party, and, they've, and it's kind of embodied in and enforced by the leader. When you take the leader out, then a lot of those bargains and compromises may well be, you know, up for grabs. And so can they, in the short time they have left, not only find a new leader, but reunify and be, be able, in fighting trim, to actually fight an election and not look like a divided party? That's very much in doubt at this point. Well, because, Chantal, there is now, there are rumors of, of a couple of women maybe stepping in here, Christine Elliott, uh, Cal Caroline Mulroney, and I wonder whether that actually would be a more difficult race for Kathleen Wynne. And there's actually, as, as Andrew says, perhaps this will, this could work out for them after all. 
Well, it's not that they lack candidates. You add Lisa Raid to the mix mm -hmm. uh, uh, that would be viable, but it, they do lack time to get this done. There is not, as far as I can tell, a consensus candidate among those. Uh, and uh, the, this is, and to Andrew's point, this is a party that uh, has a number of factions. Possibly the, the, the prospect of a hanging in the morning would focus minds on rallying behind one person. Mm -hmm. But at this point, it's far from clear that there, there is a clear path forward. We're talking about, you know, people say there are four months to the election. We're talking about the actual vote. The campaign is not four months away. It's even closer. Yeah. In some uh, ways, it's already started. Yeah, very true. Althea, what do you make of the fact that um, I think the thing that shocked me the most about what, what Patrick Brown said was he didn't seem to understand the moment we are in uh, culturally. And I, I wonder if that speaks to, and, and, I, and we'll get to Kent Herod, I think, I just wonder whether that moment has translated either into this country or into politics. And by that moment, I mean the Me Too movement and this sort of mm -hmm. uprising of women. I think it's very easy for us to sort of sit in the television studio and talk about it being detached from an emotional engagement that he must have felt. You know, to have one's political career sort of flash before your eyes, I think that it's understandable that he was completely shocked and not thinking about the Me Too movement or the carefully worded statement that we saw from Ken Hare today. You know, I think that at some point you're sort of grieving for what you spent so many years building and seeing destroyed right in front of you. Let, let me play a clip for the uh, of, for for everyone of the prime minister. This was before Kent Hare resigned, but he was asked sort of about the allegations in particular that came out on Twitter. Here's the prime minister. It's really important to believe and support uh, any woman who comes forward with uh, allegations of sexual harassment or or sexual assault. I am unequivocal in uh, my support uh, for women who step forward with uh, with allegations of this nature, uh, and that continues. Uh, I haven't yet had the opportunity to speak uh, directly with Kent. Uh, I will in the coming hours. So, I mean, this is a little bit different, not quite the same, but it is a situation of someone uh, making inappropriate comments, you know, some time ago, uh, and then once they verified uh, with, the, with the woman, the, the accuser, they felt that, he, I guess, he couldn't stay. Chantal, what, what do you make of that? Uh, that uh, zero tolerance is a very broad term in, in this instance, and that we will be discussing issues like that uh, again on other evenings. Uh, because the, the, we have not yet seen the cocktail of, of the Me Too movement and electoral politics in this country. We just got a sample of it today. Uh, I don't think this is the last time that we're going to be witnessing those kinds of events over the next few months. Andrew. I, I agree with that. Um, it's a little disturbing, I will say, that we are in the situation where we are forced to take an allegation as fact. Um, I think the, in these cases, we've decided that these look credible, and that's fine. Uh, and you, you're not entitled as a party leader to the same kind of presumption of innocence that you do in a court of law. But we're kind of figuring out as we go along here. Uh, and I hope over time we can figure out exactly what the rules are as to how we're going to weigh evidence on these things, how we're going to assess these things. Because, you know, it's fine to say believe, but we're not every allegation is always and everywhere going to be true. And we will betide us if we come up against one that's not true. We, in this case, we trusted, among other things, the judgment of the news reporters who report in the story, and they're not going to throw a story out there without careful regard for what that's going to mean for their reputation as, as news gatherers. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I, I can't say that Patrick, Patrick Brown is the victim of any great injustice. I just worry, are we figuring this out as we go along where we're going with this? Well, yeah, in the case of, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, in the case of Kent Hare, I mean, there is now an investigation that the Prime Minister's office has launched beyond just calling the woman making the allegations. But this was not the first time that he got himself in hot water, right? Like, he had made these other questionable comments. Go ahead, Althea. Yeah, I mean, the Prime Minister could have had many other reasons to shuffle him out, him out of Cabinet at the next possible opportunity. Sure. Um, I don't think he expected uh, this to come out. It's interesting, though, that Mr. Hare remains a member of caucus um, while this investigation takes place. I think the lesson to uh, potential survivors out there, victims, is that you will get more justice if you go public than if you sort of make your case known uh, through the formal channels. I think that's something that we've definitely learned this week. Chantal, last word to you on that. Yes, but make no mistake, we've set a bar with the Patrick Brown thing, and that is that 
uh, people who go public but remain anonymous can end a career, mm -hmm. anybody's career, uh, and, and that troubles me as much as it troubles Andrew. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.